Lee Dennison is the top is the speaker today for the Great War Discussion Group. He is he has been interested in the whole question of German activities during the war, really before we got involved. And while there was a lot of denial going on, especially by the Germans, uh, but also by a lot of Americans, there's no question that the German government uh, was active in the invisible war before the war. So, Lee, tell us about the war before the war. Okay. One thing I want to put out as a kind of a disclaimer. I'm not going to be saying much of anything about German espionage for the simple reason that there is very, very little, if any, information about it available. Uh, it didn't attack, attract attention, but bombs and economic warfare did. And you had a whole lot of writing about that starting as early as 1917, and the latest source I found was 2021. A, cop, a couple of comments about sources. Much of it we are denied access to because many of the German archives were destroyed deliberately at the end of World War I. So we have at most a partial picture of a lot of this stuff. And secondly, there are quite a few uh, more or less autobiographical works, all of which belong firmly on the fantasy fiction shelf. They fall under two categories. I wasn't there, I didn't do it, I'm innocent, or I was the greatest spy that ever lived. And they're both about equally reliable in terms of fact. Now, in July of 1914, uh, about a week after the assassination, Johann von Bernstorff, the German ambassador to the U.S., got a message from Berlin telling him to return to Germany for consultation. Didn't say what it was going to be about, just that consultation would be taking place. So he dutifully books a uh, cabin on the Vaterland, Germany's number one uh, transatlantic liner, and about a week later, departs for Germany. Crossing takes about a week. He gets there, puts a, a, sh a short visit to his uh, family home in southern Germany, then goes to Berlin. As far as we can tell, he didn't meet anybody in the foreign ministry. Who he did meet is this gentleman, Major Walter Nikolai, the chief of Abteilung 3 Bay, Section 3B of the German General Staff. He is the Chief of Military Intelligence for Germany. And if everybody thinks that a major is a pretty low rank, in Germany your position counted often much more than your substantive rank. Now what Major Nikolai tells Bernstorff is, first of all, there's going to be a war. This is fairly late in July, so the indications probably were pretty strong. Number two, and for the past 20 years, Germany has been putting most of their intelligence assets into France, Britain, and Russia. And there is exactly one German intelligence agent in the United States, beyond those that work in the embassy or the uh, uh, consulates. His name is Scheele. He's an a, a chemist who has been there since 1893 as a sleeper agent. He runs a pharmacy and his job is economic and industrial espionage. Sends in a report once every two or three months. However, Germany feels it needs to watch the U.S. a lot closer given our monetary and industrial power. Therefore, Count von Bernstorff, from this point on, you're in charge of all German clandestine activity in the United States. Uh, we have no information as to what von Bernstorff felt about that. However, he is told he will get instructions from time to time and additional people will be sent to help him. He is also given a briefcase full of unsigned and undated 
German central bank promissory notes that he's supposed to take back and sell in the U.S. to finance his operations. And they seem mostly to have been six months notes, which may indicate just how long the German government thought that at that, that time the war was going to last. Now, these phases are mine, looking at the events, but this is the way it kind of breaks out. From August to November 1914, the emphasis was on propaganda and espionage. In other words, trying to convince the U.S. to be friends with Germany and trying to figure out if they were going to be, although there were some attempts to do things in Canada. But by the end of November 1914, it was obvious that the Allies were ordering and getting vast quantities of stuff from the U.S., and that they were not having much progress at all in convincing the U.S. to be Germany's pal. So from December of 1914 through February of 1917, when we severed diplomatic relations, the word is buy, burn, and bomb. Buy it up and keep it out of the Allied hands. Burn it down if you can't. Blow it up if necessary. Now, from February to April in 1917, I call it reorganization. With the severance of diplomatic relations, all of a sudden, all the people in the embassy and those in the uh, uh, consulates who had been coordinating these efforts have to go home. There is, however, a backup organization that had been built over time. It takes a little bit of a while for them to try and get back into the saddle, but they work at it. However, in April 1917, the U.S. declares war, and that changes the game. Up until then, U.S. laws had not provided much in the way of what you would call serious penalties for the kinds of things the Germans were doing. Uh, about four years in prison was the maximum sentence that existing law uh, would allow. But uh, in April, we declare war. And all of a sudden, you can be court-martialed. And under military law of the day, that could include penalties up to and including death. I call it disorganization. They still manage to do some things, but the steam has mostly gone out of it. And what challenges do they have? Money to begin with. Intelligence operations run on money and vast amounts of it. Uh, he had the imperial treasury notes when he came back from uh, to start with, but not many people in the U.S., even the German banks, wanted to buy them. And shortly into the war, uh, Woodrow Wilson put out the word that buying European debt was probably not a good idea. So they just didn't get much out of it. They could still run international bank transfers, sometimes having to go through big cutouts because most of the clearance for these banks was done in Britain, and the Brits were not necessarily going to facilitate things very much. Uh, sometimes they would send money from a German bank to a Swiss or to a Swedish bank, which then would transfer it to a Swiss or Swedish branch in the U.S., which would transfer it back to a German branch, which would eventually get it to the embassy or to whoever. Operational profits, oddly, a few things that they did actually made money, and that money went into the, uh, the coffers of the embassy. Commercial account transfers happened not wildly often, but every once in a while, a German company that had a substantial uh, cash balance in an American bank, one of their American branches, would be instructed to transfer that cash to the German embassy. And then the company itself would be compensated back in Germany uh, by the, the central uh, the German treasury. And finally, hand-carried financial documents. They were able to filter people into the U.S. remarkably often uh, under different circumstances. And very often these people would carry along with them bank transfers, promissory notes, various other documents that would let them then produce money in the U.S. Uh, how much was spent varies, estimates vary between 32 and $50 million, which would be a couple of billion in today's money. Secondly is communication. 
both directions. There were two German radio stations, one in Long Island and one in New Jersey. Uh, but the U.S. Navy moved into both of them almost immediately after the start of the war under neutrality rules. You were not allowed to send a coded message out of the U.S. without giving the United States government a copy of the code. That applies to everybody except the embassy. Now, you can't do that to a, a foreign ambassador. Uh, they didn't, though, appear to pay much attention to coded messages coming in to the U.S. I guess the theory is if it goes out, it could compromise neutrality. Nothing they can do coming in. German cables had all been cut early in the war, but you could still out go uh, out through neutrals. The Germans had one they called the, the Swedish roundabout. Cable would go from Berlin to the German embassy in Stockholm, be handed to the Swedish foreign office, because the Swedish government was friendly. The Swedes then send it, believe it or not, to their embassy in Buenos Aires. And from there, it would be handed back to the German embassy in Buenos Aires, which could then send it up to the United States by various different methods that the British couldn't get in the way of. They did use messengers, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. And international mail continued to function throughout the war, uh, secret writing of various kinds. Uh, some of it was stuff you tried to hide in the text. Others was uh, invisible ink. And there developed quite a battle between British and American on one side and the Germans on the other in invisible ink. And finally is organization. Now, the organization of the system in the U.S. starts from the top with what's called the Secret War Council. Von Bernstorff is the chairman. He denies it vehemently. Later, uh, if he was P Pinocchio, he'd be in real trouble. It consists, to start with, of Heinrich Albert, who arrives in the U.S. about the same time Bernstorff does coming back. He is the commercial attaché at the embassy supposedly there to buy things for Germany. He's actually the paymaster for their espionage, sabotage, and uh, uh, propaganda efforts. Carl Boyed and Franz von Papen are the uniformed attachés there. They're the ones who get involved in what might be later called the wet work, the actual violent stuff. Dernberg is supposedly the representative of the German Red Cross. He's the propagandist. He's also the first one to get chased out of the country because after the sinking of the Lusitania, he gives a number of rather uh, aggressive speeches approving of the whole thing. And it causes so much public uh, outrage that he's forced to go back to Germany in June of 1915. Uh, Boyed and von Papen both get uh, PNG'd, persona non grata, at the end of 1915, for reasons I'll talk about. Albert and Bernstorff, even though they're strongly suspected, stay until the severance of uh, diplomatic relations. Now, below them, they have what I call the front line. These are the guys who are either organizing uh, small groups of agents or are actually doing some of the more important uh, violent work themselves. At any given time, I think the maximum number of those in the United States probably didn't exceed two dozen. They are all either Germans or first generation German Americans. Uh, and then the identities change as some of them get arrested or go back to Germany for one reason or another, uh, or something happens. The numbers go up and down. Maximum probably is achieved at the end of 1915, beginning of 1916. Now, out of these eight, all of whom I'll talk about later, one dies before the end of the war. Three ended up being prosecuted and go to prison. One turns state's evidence and uh, testifies against his German colleagues, after which going home to Germany is no longer an option. Two of them make it to Mexico when the U.S. declares war. One of them stays there and continues trying to stir up trouble with Mexico. One of them tries to get back into the U.S., is arrested, court-martialed, and sentenced to death. 
the only German spy we do sentence to death. The sentence, however, is never carried out because of the end of the war. And one of them actually gets away with it. Now, beyond them, we have all the ones who do things for the effort, some of them very small, some of them just stand around and watch and report. Uh, some of them do things like carry firebombs on board ships. Uh, maybe some of them set fires in, in various factories. We don't know for sure. They basically break down into two groups. One of them is motivated by ideology, by belief in a, uh, a cause. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean Germany because the Irish and Indians are more interested in hurting Britain. And it's a case of Germany is against them, so my enemy, my, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The other half, and it's probably sizable, are uh, motivated by money. Uh, and that may include things like longshoremen who are perfectly willing to take a, uh, a, a slow incendiary device on board a ship, uh, but they're more willing to do it if you give them 20 bucks. We also have a couple of strange ones, which I will get to a little bit later. How many do we have in total? There's absolutely no way to know. There are no records that give any kind of an effective, uh, believable count. It might be as much as a number of low thousands, many of whom would have done one thing and nothing again. Those that were much more active, you probably have a few hundred. Uh, most of them, by the way, don't suffer any consequences. There are a few that are swept up with other uh, efforts. Now, one of the first things they have to worry about is resupplying German naval surface raiders. Start of the war, Germany still has naval vessels uh, running around on the ocean. Uh, but the problem they have is they can't obviously can't come into any allied port to resupply. If they come into neutral ports, they are likely to be interned. So what Germany does is set up a system where in various ports around the world, uh, German officers uh, either charter or buy ships, load them with supplies, and send them out to try and rend rendezvous with the raiders. Happens with about a dozen out of New York, a few more out of San Francisco. Now, only about four of the New Yorkers managed to get out. Some of them get swept up by the British. Some just never make it past customs because they're using phony papers. When von Spee's squadron is destroyed in December of 1915, that cuts out almost all of them. The Karlsruhe there is a light cruiser. It's been running around in the uh, uh, Caribbean. And it drives everybody nuts because it seems to disappear. What actually happens is that on the 4th of November, 1914, it has an explosion in its forward magazines that blows the ship in two. The front third sinks quickly, taking the captain. The back third stays afloat long enough for him to get on one of the ships they had accompanying them and make it back to, uh, to port. After about the second or third month of 1915, this is all over with. Second is taking care of all of the reservists who want to get back to Germany. Now, a U.S. passport back then looked like this. Uh, that is, it looked like this up until uh, after December 1914, because before that, you didn't even have to have a photograph on a passport. You filled out an application, you sent it to a passport office, and they were scattered all over the place. And in a few, literally in a few days, you'd get your passport back. And basically, all it does is have descriptive data, physical description of the person there, and some information. It's really pretty weak security. Now, the problem they have with the reservists is most of them either don't have a passport or they've got a German passport. And a young man with a German passport on a ship going across the Atlantic probably has a good chance of ending up being a guest of the British government. So what they do is start buying passports 
uh, from all over the place. Everything, everybody will sell them a passport. Not enough of those to go around. So they set up a counterfeiting operation run by this character, Hans von Vedel. Uh, and basically what he does is go around to the flop houses and hotels and tell people, come, assign, come apply for a passport and I'll give you 20 bucks. He then alters the passport to fit the description of a German who wants to go home and they merely send them on their way. They don't send many people actually, a few hundred, and almost all of them are reserve officers. They don't bother with the privates uh, sending them back. However, von Vedel gets a little greedy, tries to shortchange some of the people who are coming in and they blow the whistle on him. By Christmas of 1914, he's being watched. He takes off and heads for Cuba. His assistant tries to keep things going, but it's raided on the 1st of January and the whole thing is shut down. Uh, von Vedel, by the way, tries to get back to Germany. Uh, he's picked up by the, uh, the British and the British ship he's on heading back to England is torpedoed and he goes down with it. Now the Velen Canal is in Canada. It connects Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, and it's the only way you can get shipping through. Uh, the natural connection is the Niagara River, and Niagara Falls makes it a little hard to take a ship through. Early on, the Germans decide, let's try and kill this thing because number one, it's being used to ship stuff out, and number two, it'll make the Canadians keep troops at home. How do we do it? What do we do? Well, September 1914, this character pops up. He calls himself Horst von der Goltz, probably born as one Franz Wachendorf. Uh, takes the von der Goltz name later on because it's a very prominent German name. According to him, in the book he wrote, uh, he was probably the greatest spy that ever lived. Uh, you know, get, get stuff that was written by James, by... Uh, any spy age uh, author of the modern day on a bad day when he's had a, a hangover and you might get close to it. But by 1914, he is an officer in one of the various armies that's running around Mexico somehow or another. But he gets word that they want him to go to New York and report to Von Papen, the military attache, which he does. Von Papen, in one of the more ridiculously planned operations of the war, basically tells von der Goltz, go put together a team and go blow up the Welland Canal. That's about the extent of planning that goes into it. Von der Goltz gets some dynamite from a German, uh, puts together a team of something less than stellar individuals, and goes up to Niagara Falls. He supposedly takes a look at the uh, the canal, discovers that it's entirely too well guarded, and gives the whole thing up, leaves the dynamite up there, and goes back to New York. Von Poppen is not pleased, sends von der Goltz back to Germany. Now, once back there, he must have told a good story because they sent him from Germany back to Britain to try, try and do some collection under the age, the aid, the name of Bridgman Taylor. That's what's on his passport, supposedly from El Paso, Texas. Now, the first thing he does, an indicator of wonderful tradescraft, he checks into a hotel in London under that fake name. The only problem is at that point, if you were a foreigner, you had to register with the British police within 10 days. He doesn't. He is arrested. Doesn't take him long to figure out that he is not who he says he is. So he ends up in prison for quite some time in Britain. Now, eventually, uh, they keep putting the pressure on him, and he begins telling him things like the Welland Canal attempt. He eventually is shipped back to the U.S., and in later uh, trials, just testifies against the other uh, Germans, which of course means that he's not going home anytime soon. In return for that, he isn't tried, but he is interned on Ellis Island for a while. He eventually 
asks for and receives asylum in the U.S., and he goes to Hollywood and becomes an actor in propaganda movies. I am von der Goltz, the spy. And the movie, The Prussian Kerr, uh, The Prussian Kerr, in, of course, in this case, is Kaiser Wilhelm. He acts in a couple of others, and as far as I can tell, lives out the rest of his life in the U.S. Now, they try again on the Bellin Canal a year later, send this guy, Paul Koenig, I'll talk more about him in a minute, up. He's a much harder character, but he comes to the same conclusion that von der Goltz does. It's too hard, so they drop it and don't try it again. Now, the first big fire is a place called the Roebling Wire Rope Company. They're making components for artillery carriages and uh, mooring lines for sea mines. And on the 18th of January, 1915, somebody disables the fire alarm and a whole bunch of fires are set. The building burns down. And it sets a pattern for later fires. The investigations are crap. Mostly the owners just want to get their, uh, their insurance claims settled so they can rebuild. Uh, the people that are doing the so-called criminal investigation are, they have no idea what to do. They don't prove anything. You get explanations for it ranging from disaffected foreigners to somebody dropped a cigar. However, we still don't know who actually did it. Was this German? Was it local labor problems? We don't know. And that's the case with most of these things that happened during the war. Now, here's another example of wonderful planning. Vanceboro, Maine sits on the border with Canada in northeastern Maine. There's a river that's at the border, border and there's a railroad bridge there. Uh, von Papen becomes convinced that it's being used to carry uh, material from the U.S. to Canada for shipment abroad. So he wants to destroy the bridge. How do you do it? Again, here comes the good idea fairy sure in place. This is Werner Horn. He is a reserve lieutenant in the German army. Uh, but for the past several years, he's been running a coffee plantation in Guatemala. When the call up for the reservist occurs, he comes up, quits his job, comes to New York and goes to see von Papen. who thinks, thinks, okay, I've got a guy I can use to blow up the bridge. Now, Horn's full instructions from von Papen is, here's a uh, suitcase full of dynamite. I want you to go to Vanceboro, uh, put it on the bridge and blow it up. And oh, by the way, here are two red, black, and white cockades that you can pin on your arm so that you can say that you're a German soldier at war. Now, Horn, I don't think was the brightest spoon in the box, but he goes on, he goes up, gets off the train in Vanceboro. First thing he does is try and hide his suitcase with people watching him. Goes and takes a full view, daylight recon of the bridge. Comes back, checks into a hotel, waits till the middle of the night. This is February in Maine, folks. The wind chill is about 15 degrees below zero. Gets out, makes his way to the bridge, three or four false starts, finally gets the fuse set, runs back to the American side. The bomb goes off, does minimal damage, but it blows out windows on both sides. Doesn't take people long to figure out who's responsible. And the local deputy sheriff, who also happens to run the grocery store, arrests him. Now, people both in Canada and in Vanceboro are talking about lynching. But they managed to get Horn away. He's initially charged with vandalism because of all the windows that were broken. Uh, as he points out, the explosion took place in Canada, not in the U.S. So he initially gets 18 months in jail. 
But then the federal government steps in, charges him with carrying explosives on a common carrier. He gets a longer prison sentence. When we get into the war, they turn him over to the Canadians who give him a 10-year prison sentence. But by 1921, a Canadian doctor certifies he's insane, sends him home where they find that he's suffering from tertiary syphilis. Now, Annie Larson is not a person. Annie Larson is a ship, a fairly broken down wind jammer uh, on the West Coast that does general cargo up and down operating out of San Diego. It's important because Germany has been in touch with various Indian anti-British groups, both in Europe and in the US for a long time. They're perfectly happy to stir up trouble for uh, England in India. What they're gonna do now is they're going to buy a bunch of weapons and give them to one of these Indian groups in the US. They're gonna smuggle them out, load them on the Andy Larson, and through a overly complicated method, try and get them to India. This character, one Hans Tauscher, is Krupp's representative in the US. He buys the weapons, he gets a whole bunch of post-Civil War uh, surplus arms from a dealer. He tried to buy a bunch of Craig Jorgensen rifles from uh, the Spanish-American War and couldn't pull it off. They get shipped west uh, through various fake documents and so forth, and they are loaded on the Annie Larson. Now, the Annie Larson is incapable of crossing the Pacific by itself. So what they're supposed to do is go to a little place called Socotra Island, which is this fly speck uninhibited desert island off the coast of Mexico, drop anchor and wait for a steamship called the Maverick, which is gonna come pick the weapons up. It'll also have a bunch of the Indian revolutionaries on it and take them off to India. Annie Larson drops that anchor and waits and waits and waits. They run out of food and water. They go into port in Acapulco to reload. They go back to Socorro, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait. And eventually, the captain just gives up, uh, weather being what it is for a sailing ship. The first port he can make is Hoquiam, Washington. Now, he comes into port in Hoquiam, the local customs inspector comes on board, doesn't like anything, seizes the cargo. The cargo eventually gets sold off back to the original surplus dealer. And the Annie Larson runs off and goes back to just doing its normal thing. However, later on, this whole thing, as they get investigated, ends up uh, causing the largest trial of any coming out of the war. And it takes people all the way from the Consul General in San Francisco down through everybody that helped them do it, plus a whole bunch of the Indians. Now, phenol is a chemical which is a precursor chemical to a whole lot of uh, industrial processes. Before the war, we bought most of our phenol from Britain. They're using it all. It's used to make picric acid, explosive, goes into making uh, phonograph records, particularly the kinds that Thomas Edison make, and it goes into making aspirin. We gotta have it. Where does it come from? Well, enter Thomas Edison himself. He is not only a, uh, an inventor, he's a cutthroat businessman. He builds his own phenol plant, produces more than enough for him, and a couple of tons a day extra. Now, what do you want to do with that? Well, this gentleman, Dr. Hugo Schweitzer, is a senior chemist for Bayer, which is actually Bayer, Bavarian, German company. What he comes up with is the idea he goes to Dr. Albert, gets the money, sets up a, color, a couple of, of uh, <clears throat> fake companies, and buys the extra phenol from Edison so it doesn't go into things like making explosives. Then it gets sold off to make nitrogen fertilizer 
and Bayer, of course, gets their share to make aspirin. This works fine, but in July of 1915, word gets out what's going on, uh, and pressure begins to build on Edison. Uh, he eventually cuts the deal off and just turns the extra phenol over to the U.S. military from that point on. Dr. Schweitzer's comment was that he thought it was better to make fertilizer and aspirin than it was to make explosives. The most elaborate economic thing they did was the Bridgeport Projectile Company. Now, this thing is incorporated in Bridgeport, Connecticut in April of 1915 by a couple of Americans who are, let's just say, very happy to help in the process and make a whole lot of money while they're doing it. The idea is you're going to build a supposedly actual company to make artillery shells. But what they do is, first of all, buy up the entire production of machine tools needed to make these shells for a year's production. Takes them completely out of circulation for anybody else who wants to make stuff. They then, then do things like sign contracts for delivery of materials and then wait for a little while and then cancel the contract, pay us a, a, a penalty maybe, but the other people are left having to start all over again. They hire workers. They're actually building this these buildings. They hire workers, pay them one and a half times the going rate in hopes of causing labor problems elsewhere <clears throat> because there's a lot of military plants in Bridgeport. It goes on and on and on. Uh, they buy the complete year's production of smokeless powder uh, from one uh, Etna a powder plant, and then try to sell it first to Spain and then to Brazil. Anything they could do to basically disrupt the uh, the production and transmittal of materials. It's hard to say whether they're effective, but they're a pain in a lot of people's behinds. Now, I mentioned the crackpot way back. Let's get him out of the way. Allow me to introduce one Eric Munter. He is of German origin, but in 1906, He's an instructor in German language at Harvard. He's married, got two children. His wife falls ill, gets sicker and sicker and eventually dies. He, of course, is heartbroken, wants to take her body off immediately <clears throat> to Chicago where his parents, her parents are, uh, but the local authorities conduct an autopsy. And after he's gone with her body, they discover arsenic. They immediately issue a warrant for his arrest. He takes off, shakes off, his, uh, shaves off his beard, dumps his kids with his with their grandparents, and disappears. Becomes Eric, I mean, because Frank Holt <clears throat> goes to Mexico for a while, and then works his way back into the U.S. into Texas. Gets back into the line of teaching German, remarries, works his way back up through the ladder of academics. And by 1914, he's teaching German at Cornell. But he is outraged that the United States is sending all these weapons uh, to the Allies. He goes and talks to von Papen, and uh, he's too far out even for, on, for von Papen. But he gets a hold of some dynamite and makes a uh, time bomb. And in July 1915, he takes it in, plants it in a waiting room in the United States Senate. Now, it's set to deni deni detonate uh, after dark, so nobody's killed. He waits around, waits for the explosion, which does put quite a bit of damage, and then heads off to New York to the house of J.P. Morgan, Jr., the head of the House of Morgan, who's coordinating all the loans to the Allies. He says his intent is to force Morgan to agree to not do that anymore. His method is to use a pistol. Uh, he breaks into the house. He manages to wound Morgan before he is himself bashed in the head with a lump of coal by the butler. He is then taken to jail in Mineola, New York, where he becomes the man who commits suicide or dies three different ways, at least according to three different reports. First one is that somehow or another, the Germans found out where he was, 
managed to find out what cell he was in, managed to find somebody who could get into the right spot to stick a pistol through the window and shoot him. Secondly, that he managed to peel off the little thin metal cup that holds the eraser on a wooden pencil and cut his wrists with it. Okay, now the third one, which is probably true, is that he had been actually put on suicide watch, and their method was to leave the cell door open and put a guard in a chair right in front of it. At some point, the guard, for reasons unknown, moves away for a little bit. He gets out, climbs up on top of his cell, and then does a nosedive into the floor down below, crushing his skull. In any case, there's never any connection between him and anybody else, but boy, do the newspapers have fun with it. Somebody that does get connected with is Franz von Rintelen. Now, there is, by the way, some doubt as to whether he is entitled to the Vaughn in that name. Uh, but at the start of the war, he is a junior, and I do mean junior, staff officer on the German naval staff. He's a reserve Leutnant Zerse, which is the same as a lieutenant junior grade in the U.S. Navy. But according to him, again, he is the financial brains of the general, German, of the uh, uh, ambassador. I'll get this right yet. The Admiralty staff. Uh, he does come from a banking family and had worked at a bank in the U.S. for a while. But he again is outraged that things are not being done more to stop the US from shipping things over. And he somehow or another manages to convince his superiors to send him to the US. Uh, he gets a small promotion to Capitaine Leutnant, which would uh, more or less be Lieutenant in the US Navy, and departs under a uh, Swiss passport as Emile Gachet. Gets to the US, He's been told to report to Von Poppen and to Boyed, which he does, and it's immediately a mutual dislike society. Uh, he is arrogant. He is self-important. He is convinced that he is God's a gift to German sabotage, and he does not make himself popular at all with the two attaches. He goes off, sets up his own office in New York, and by the way, most of the German offices were in New York, and sets about, as a very busy little bee, doing all sorts of things. Sets up an import-export business that cheats Russians, tries to uh, set up and start all sorts of labor problems. And then he meets this man, Paul Koenig. Saw him before with the uh, second attempt at the, uh, at the canal. Koenig had been the security chief for the Hamburg America line. So he already had a network of about 30 agents all over New York Harbor. He is a very rough, violent individual. Uh, and <clears throat> he's the guy that puts various parts of von Rintelen's plans uh, into actual function. Uh, Rintelen doesn't do much himself. He does everything wrong as an agent. Uh, for a while, he actually goes and lives at the New York Yacht Club. There are three German members of the New York Yacht Club, the Kaiser, Prince Heinrich, and Franz von Rintelen. This is not keeping a low profile. Now, I mentioned way back when that Germany had one sleeper agent in the US. That's him. Walter Scheel. He's a chemist. Uh, his cover uh, operation was running a pharmacy in New Jersey. But once they get things going, he gets summoned and told he's to put his brain to work coming up with ways to destroy shipments of supplies going to the Allies. What he develops is what's called a cigar bomb. Now, the photograph here is a later version of it, but the original is, the description is like a piece of lead pipe with a copper uh, a plug soldered into the middle of it. You fill one end with picric acid, the other end with nitric acid, and then seal the ends 
uh, with wax. Now, what this does is the nitric acid attacks the copper, eventually eating its way through. And as soon as it meets the picric acid, they're hypergolic. They don't like each other violently. They fly, go into a very, very strong flame, burning pretty much anything in the vicinity. Uh, and when you're done, all that's left is a little bit of melted lead. So it's a rather good incendiary device. <clears throat> he makes them in various numbers and the, the descriptions vary from about 10 inches long to about four inches long. But what they do is they take them out and they are distributed to generally Irish longshoremen uh, and sometimes to the German sailors that are working alongshoremen. Slip them a little money and tell them, go put this aboard this ship that's going to Britain loaded with ammunition. A uh, ship goes out, fire starts at sea. Uh, the favored place to put them, by the way, is in shipments of sugar because sugar burns violently, burns hotly, and it's very hard to put out. How many did they successfully do it to? The official count is 37, but there may have been many, many more. These things were not wildly reliable. And very often the fire could have been put out and never really reported. Uh, they are tracked down. It's, they figure out what's going on when some unexploded ones are found in ships docking on the European end. They have another problem, too, one that always comes up uh, when you have spies, and that's people and money. Now, shield, the, the bombs themselves, the bodies, were made in the engineering spaces of one of the interned German ships, the Friedrich de Gosse. They were then taken out and taken to a laboratory that Scheel had where they were filled with the chemicals. And how thick the copper was and which chemicals you used would dictate how long it took to burn. Scheel didn't want to uh, actually uh, supervise that himself, so he hires, hires this guy, Charles von Kleist who is an elderly German ex-sea captain. Uh, but after a while, Scheel and von Kleist have a falling out. Uh, Scheel thinks that Kleist drinks too much, and he kicks him out, but without paying him for the last couple of months. Kleist then begins to wander around German uh, bars complaining. What he doesn't understand at one point is the person he's complaining to is a German-speaking New York Police Department detective. So after a little while, they extract all the information from him. And by April of 1916, the NYPD bomb squad busts this thing wide open. They arrest most of the people involved. Uh, when Kleist ends up going to prison and dying in prison, he's in 69 at the end of the war. Scheel manages to escape and gets to Cuba. And for a long time, everybody thought he'd made it back to Germany till he wrote a letter to his wife that got noticed, in which case American agents went to Cuba and arrested him. That's the only picture of him, and that's on the ship coming back. But Scheel uh, proves that he knows all about these bombs, but also a lot of other stuff. And he becomes a very valuable contributor to the U.S. government and never serves a day in prison. Also early on, this guy appears in New York. His name is Robert Fay. Uh, he was a German infantry lieutenant with a inventing mind. He comes up with a design for a bomb that everybody says looks wonderful. So he's sent to the U.S. to try and put it together. However, he doesn't want to meet with von Papen and Boyette. He thinks they're watched. They are. Figures out his own way to get uh, some explosives. And what he wants is to be able to put bombs on the rudders of ships that would go off and blow the rudder off at sea. Only problem is that, again, he talks to the wrong people. And before he's able to put the first of them out, uh, he is arrested by the New York Police Department. Uh, he is convicted, 
sentenced to prison, goes to the, the federal penitentiary in Atlanta and escapes, manages to get to Mexico and from Mexico to Spain, but he can't get out of Spain and eventually uh, surrenders to American authorities, brought back, finishes his sentence and stays in the U.S. for the rest of his life. I mentioned uh, von Rentlen trying to get into the labor market. One way is something called Labor's National Peace Council. He met this character, David Lamar. Now, Lamar is a con man. Uh, he was probably the first guy given the title of the Wolf of uh, Wall Street. He does lots of pump and dump stuff, cheats people, just He's a crook of, of first water, but he manages to convince Rent, Rent, excuse me, Rentlin that he knows people in the labor and the mar market, and he knows and has politicians in his pocket, et cetera, et cetera. So they go about trying to set up an organization called Labor's National Peace Council, which is designed to disrupt the labor market in the U.S. They find and bring in. Representative Frank Buchanan. Now, Buchanan is a former iron worker who got elected to the House of Representatives on a very left wing uh, labor associated market. And Buchanan is perfectly happy to be named the chairman of Labor's National Peace Council. First of all, he does think that it's the war is against labor. So that goes along with an honestly held opinion. But he's also not at all unhappy with the about $1,200 a month that's being paid to him uh, in this position. Now, the first big meeting they have, Lamar is supposed to have produced all these hundreds of people. 50 people show up. Now, while this is all going on, Buchanan is trying to convince Samuel Gompers the chairman of the American Federation of Labor and probably the number one labor leader in the U.S., to participate. Gompers wants nothing to do with it. He already smells that it's German money, uh, despite the fact they claim it's not. And very shortly thereafter, one H. Snowden Marshall, who is the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, gets involved, gets in, uh, convenes a, uh, a grand jury, Buchanan panics, tries to use the House of Representatives to impeach Marshall. It doesn't work. Lamar apparently gets quite a bit of money from Rentlin and more or less makes himself scarce, although he is later, later arrested. Um, eventually, they return uh, indictments against uh, Buchanan and Lamar, and against Rintlin. And in the end, Rintlin's conviction, when he finally is convicted, is for violation of the antitrust laws, not for any of the other stuff he does. Uh, this disintegrates fairly quickly uh, later in 1915. But there's another one that happens. The Agency for the Employment of German Workers. Now, the German and Austro-Hungarian embassies have been sending letters out to German and Austrian workers that they know are employed in the munitions industries, basically telling them that making ammunition for the Allies is treason, and you make yourself uh, liable to all sorts of legal at, uh, problems when you go home. Uh, Dr. Dumba, the Austro-Hungarian ambassador, is the big one on the Austrian side, of von Papen is doing it on the German side. What they do is form an organization with that name on it. And the idea very simply is if, if you're a German worker and you quit working for a, uh, an American ammunition maker, we will help you find a job. And if you can't find a job, we'll pay you for a while while you look. Nothing illegal in that, but Dr. Dumba and von Papen are also financing all sorts of other labor organizations that are involved with disruptions. They're funneling some money in the IWW. Uh, they are sending money to various 
uh, black organizations in the hope that they will stir up trouble. And in August, uh, Dr. Dumba, rather poor judgment, gives a whole bunch of papers and so forth to an individual who is supposed to be going to Germany, an American uh, uh, journalist that I'll talk about more about in a minute. The only problem is by then, he's being very carefully watched by the British. The British take the man off of the uh, ship he's on, go through all the papers and very gleefully send back everything that talks about all of the things that they are doing. The result is that in August 1915, Dr. Dumba is declared persona non grata and sent home. The Agency for the Employment of German Workers is pretty well dissolved. Now, I had I said way back in the story that after all of the embassy people are sent home, there's another organization around that can help coordinate things, and it's in Baltimore. Paul Hilken is a first-generation German-American. His father's a, a, an immigrant, and they are the North German Lloyd agents uh, in the United States, in Baltimore. Uh, they're so German that their uh, office building is called Hansa House and is built in the style of uh, Hamburg. Now, Hilken meets von Rentlen. Uh, Rentlen sort of pulls him into helping. You know, are you interested in helping? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the, nothing specific to start with, but a little bit later on, Hilken goes to Germany because he's involved in something that I'll talk about in more detail, at which point he is brought in and becomes the alternate paymaster for espionage and sabotage in the U.S. But Hilken doesn't get his hands directly dirty. Who he's got is this character, Friedrich Hinch, rather like... Uh, the character in New York, is a former sea captain uh, of a uh, ship that's interned there. He's a hard guy. But he also has people that can help him. One of them, I don't have a picture of him, is a black longshoreman named Eddie Felton, who is the head of a fairly good-sized organization of an African-American longshoreman. Being with the uh, labor and race relations of the day, they can go pretty much anywhere on the docks and nobody notices. So when they have things like one of the, they want to put the uh, cigar bombs on ships, Hinch gives them to Felton who passes them out to his troops. Hinch will pay uh, Felton a certain amount of money. Uh, Felton will then parcel out some of that to the people actually doing the lowing. There's also one other character. He's a kind of a weirdo. Name is Charles Herman. Now he's young, he's American. He's about 20 years old. He ends up in Germany at some point, um, supposedly going for some education. But he meets some German agents who make him convinced that this is gonna be a fun thing to do. So he is that rather strange oddity in the intelligence business, somebody who does it for the uh, the thrill of the thing. He ends up being Hinch's number two man. Now, the two of them wander around at one point or another, and there's circumstantial evidence that shortly after they are in certain places, uh, certain American facilities burn down, but there's no direct link. Now, blockade running is something that's been done for as long as there have been blockades. And to start with, it amounts to Dr. Albert, uh, and through various cutouts, hiring or even buying a neutral or an American ship, loading it up with supplies, and sending them supposedly to a neutral port, where the goods will then be taken off and sent on to Germany works sometimes. The British pick up on this pretty quick. 
Uh, a lot of these ships are simply seized. Others are taken into port and they're allowed as how, uh, well, we'll keep you here for a while. We'll get around to expect, expecting you eventually. Uh, and sometimes they just end up selling the cargo off and they actually make some money for um, the embassy doing that occasionally. But the blockade runner of all blockade runners is the U-Deutschland. Germany intends to build a class of seven oversized commercial submarines. They're not armed. The idea is they are going to sail to the U.S. loaded with obviously high value stuff, buy things and bring them back to Germany to beat the, the blockade. Hilken's first trip to Germany is to set this up. That that's the same time he's actually recruited uh, into German intelligence. Now the U Deutschland leaves Hamburg and arrives in Baltimore on the 9th of July, uh, 1916. It is loaded mostly with dye stuffs because the German chemical industry had a uh, just a, a complete lock on the manufacture of dye before the war. And the U.S. was trying to build a, a, an industry up, but didn't have it. So this stuff is fairly light and very, very valuable. Hilken had bought everything that was on the ship for about a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, he gets it to Baltimore. It's unloaded, and it's auctioned off for $3 million. Now, they reload the, the U-Deutschland with nickel and with rubber both of which are pretty critical items back in Germany. They hang around for a while. The Allies are frantic. They want the U.S. to intern this ship. Uh, it hasn't asked for internment. Uh, and the U.S. finally makes a determination that it's a merchant ship. I think more try to show that they were being even-handed with the Germans. 1st of August, 1916, uh, it heads back down Chesapeake Bay. Uh, submerges, gets through whatever line of British ships are waiting, and ends up back in Germany. They're able to make one more uh, trip across the Atlantic. The second ship of the class, the U Bremen, leaves Germany and disappears, probably hits a mine. Uh, after that, they think it's not worth doing anymore, but the U Deutschland becomes the U-155 biggest submarine in the German U-boat fleet. Uh, torpedo tubes are installed. It gets 250 millimeter deck guns, which are bigger than the guns on destroyers. So it actually outguns a destroyer that might find it. And it has a somewhat successful uh, time sinking allied ships. How did we know a lot of this stuff? Well, like I said, it was all in the papers. In July 1915, Dr. Albert is on an elevated train in New York, falls asleep, jerks awake at his station, gets off and forgets his briefcase, which is properly snatched by a U.S. Secret Service agent, illegal as it can be. He makes off with it and takes it to the Secretary of the Treasury. And you can't use anything in there, obviously illegal, uh, purposes, but they get it all published. Now, most of it is not really illegal, but it's been hidden. All of the economic stuff they're doing, all of the material that has to do with labor relations, it's really a, a, a tempest for a while. A little bit later in September of 1915, Archibald is that guy that uh, thought he was carrying all this exclusive stuff back to Germany until the British police him up and publish all his materials. Now, as a basis, as a result of those two things, plus other investigations, at the end of 1915, von Papen and Boyed, the military and naval attaches, are both declared persona non grata in the U.S. Now, von Papen gets on a ship. He's under U.S. diplomatic uh, free passage. But the British stop the ship. They get on board. And they inform von Papen that you're safe, your baggage isn't. So they confiscate his baggage. They take all the papers out of it. 
and the man has full of things like check stubs for all of the various uh, missions that he sent. He's got all sorts of things in there, all of which the British gleefully send back to the U.S., and which later on in 1916 are put before a uh, a grand jury that results in von Papen being indicted in the United States. And he stays indicted until late 1932 when he becomes chancellor of Germany for a short time, when they just decide it's not worth keeping. him. Finally, in April 1916, going along with the rolling up of the pipe bomb uh, ring, Wolf von Eagle was von Papen's successor, and he had an office in New York that was listed officially as a, an advertising office. Well, Secret Service agents break in. Von Eagle claims, tries to claim it's part of the uh, embassy, uh, which basically says, yeah, sure, and a lot more papers are collected. So much of the stuff we know comes from Thor, those four different collections of papers that have been taken from the Germans, which is carelessness cubed, folks. You don't allow that much paper to be together in one place, and you certainly don't allow it to be in a situation where it can be captured by the enemy. Now, fires go on all summer in 1915 and into 1916. The agreed number of major industrial fires in the U.S. over that time is 43. The problem is that in almost no case can a direct cause of the fire be established, and you can't prove that the Germans are responsible. It's complicated by the fact that these factories are going up like matchsticks with very, very little in the way of any attention to safety or any idea of how to take care of, some cases, vast amounts of ammunition. Were some of them German sab sabotage? Almost certainly. Were all of them? I say almost certainly not, but we'll never know exactly how many were. And one other place that causes problems is Mexico. Everybody knows about the the, the Pancho Villa raid and so forth. It started a long time before that. Germany was active in Mexico for a long, long time. In 1911, this month, Francisco Madero conducts a rebellion against the individual who'd been uh, dictator of Mexico since the middle, uh, the last half of the 18th century, uh, Porfirio Diaz. Madero is a governor. Uh, he is a pretty moderate character, partially U.S. educated, reasonably acceptable to Washington, although he Mexican, Mexico has no reason to be happy with the U.S. But by 1913, Madero has fallen out with some of his, his supporters, and one of his generals, Victoriano Huerta, uh, conducts a coup, arrests Madero and his vice president, both of whom are very conveniently shot trying to escape a few days later. Now, Washington despises Huerta on multiple levels. And in a very short period of time, by 1914, Huerta is pushed out by this man, Venustiano Carranza. Now, Huerta leaves uh, Mexico on a German warship because the Germans have been supporting him like mad goes to Spain, stays there for a little while, then comes back to New York. Doesn't claim that he has any intention of going anywhere, but as soon as he hits New York, uh, German uh, representatives, Ritalin and uh, von Papen in particular, immediately start meeting with him. Um, I'm not sure if they knew it, but the hotel room on one side of his was occupied by the U.S. Secret Service and the other side by British intelligence. So I don't think there was much said in his room that was unknown. All of the telephones are tapped by this point. Now, Huerta at one point decides 
he announces that he's going to go out to San Francisco to go to a, an exposition that's occurring out there. Gets on a train, takes off, gets to Chicago, gets off the train, leaves it, and gets on a train heading for El Paso. He wants to get back in power. Unfortunately, that is noticed by federal authorities, and uh, short of El Paso, he's taken off the train uh, by a federal marshal and a party of armed troops, and he's put into a military jail. Now, he's in and out of jail for some time. There's a lot of various kinds of, of legal stuff going on. Eventually, Huerta actually dies uh, in military custody down there. The official uh, reason for death is cirrhosis, because he did enjoy his booze. Uh, but, of course, there were rumors, and still are, that the U.S. had him disposed of, because him in power would have made Mexico a very much worse place in terms of uh, uh, German influence. Now, Carranza, he's not happy with the U.S. either. Uh, he has his hands full a little bit because he's fallen out with Pancho Villa. Now, Carranza's forces uh, consistently defeat Villa, but that just makes Villa more and more uh, frustrated as we go along. The U.S. eventually recognizes a Carranza, and it's Carranza that the Zimmerman telegram is directed to although he never really admits having gotten it. Now, some more things in Mexico. This gentleman, Felix Sommerfeld, is a long-term German intelligence agent. Uh, he was, at one point, Madero's chief of intelligence. Uh, when Huerta comes in, he leaves, goes to New York, but continues to fiddle in Mexico. And the person he tries to support is Villa, because that's going to keep things stirred up along the border with the U.S. One of the things he does, for example, is goes to a new cartridge factory built by Western Arms in Alton, Illinois, and contracts with them for a full year's production to produce 7-millimeter Mauser ammunition to be shipped to Via. It's important because none of the Allies use 7-millimeter Mauser. So what they're doing is producing ammunition that nobody can use. There continue to be pinprick raids all along the Mexican border, nothing of the scale of uh, Columbus again, but the idea on the German side is just to keep things stirred up. One more time, somebody is hit by the good idea ferry and says, let's build a submarine base uh, at Magdalena Bay uh, on Baja, California. A few small issues of, number one, getting a U-boat all the way around South America to there, uh, keeping them supplied with things like, oh, torpedoes and fuel. Uh, they it, it happens, and they work on it for a little bit, and it just sort of fades away. Then there's another one. Well, let's put together an army of these various German reservists that we know are around Mexico. There's about 80 German officers in the various Mexican armies. Uh, and let's use them as the spear point for an army of Mexicans to go up and attack Texas and New Mexico. Well, there are reservists and there are reservists. Now, if you're a German reservist who has completed his training within the last two or three years, you're probably still in pretty good shape and remember most things. If, on the other hand, you have been running an agave farm uh, to make uh, tequila for the past 15 years, the chances are good you're going to have an awful lot of work to get back in, in shape. They talk about an army of 45,000 of them. The maximum number I can find that were ever in one place at one time was about 1,500 at a camp several hundred miles south of the border. Now, along with this set of rumors, and the rumor pile grew heavily, there was one that somehow or another they'd gotten a hold of some Springfield rifles. Now, the U.S. Army didn't have enough Springfields. How in the world would Germans have gotten a hold of them? Turns out it was those 
model 1873 trapdoor Springfields that had been bought to go on the Annie Larson that they were talking about. And of course, there was nobody to use them. And the weapons themselves had been sold back to the dealer. Now, one more chapter, San Francisco. Under the heading of Franz von Bopp, the uh, Council General, seconded by Wilhelm von Brinken, who is a German naval officer. Why does a council need a naval attache? Uh, and an American named Charles Crowley, plus a number of others. Now, they managed to do a certain amount of damage uh, around the Western US. What I found. They also try to get things going up in Canada unsuccessfully. Uh, they get played very, very well by a number of people. Von Bopp is also the guy who's behind the Annie Larson business, and he's behind uh, a few other things. He actually ends up being arrested and tried twice, once for the various things they were trying to do in Canada in particular, the charge was levying war against a country the U.S. is not at war with. And then in a much bigger trial for the Annie Larson business that involved 60 odd people, all of whom were uh, convicted. And it ends on a literal bang because some of the Indian defendants had been quarreling. And right after the sentencing, one of them stands up, pulls out a pistol and shoots another one dead and is himself then shot dead by a U.S. Marshal. But the prizes, the prize uh, workers for Von Bopp were these two, Lothar Witzke and Kurt Janke. Now, Janke is older. Uh, he is an American citizen of German origins, born in Germany. Actually was a U.S. Marine for a short time. He's a very rough character. Uh, he makes himself known to Von Bopp by setting some fires in various places around San Francisco that they would like to have destroyed. And he becomes the really the, the mastermind of sabotage in the American West. Witzke, much younger man, had been a member of the crew of the uh, cruiser Dresden, uh, the last survivor of on space uh, squadron which has been sunk in the uh, in a Chilean harbor by the British Navy. And supposedly the crew was interned. Bitska escapes, gets on a ship, comes to San Francisco, gets hooked up with Yanke. And together they go around burning and blowing things up. Again, we don't know for sure exactly what they did. Uh, there are some claims made, but proof in a legal sense probably never will exist. Uh, one of the first ones, May of 1915 is up in Seattle. It was a barge load of dynamite in Elliott Bay that went off. Three separate claims have been made over time as to who did that, but if I had to pick one, it would be those two. Later on, the latest and strangest one was the Mare Island Naval Shipyard. This is already into July of 1917. We're well into the war. Witzke claimed to have done it, uh, claimed well after the war to have done it. There's some doubt about that, but nonetheless, it was another great big explosion. But the big one, big daddy of old bangs, is Black Tom. Now, Black Tom is that little island that sits off the coast of New Jersey, connected to the mainland with a causeway and a railroad. It was the largest munitions depot in the country. That's where they took ammunition to, to be loaded on ships to send out to the Allies, particularly to Russia, but, but elsewhere. Uh, it no longer exists, by the way, as a separate piece of ground. It's all been uh, recovered uh, ground. It's been a favorite target for a long, long time. Now, by July of 16, of course, the original a batch of saboteurs from New York have been wound up. But the Brooklyn group, I mean, the, the, the Baltimore group is still around. And they are now doing things. So they came down 
And Vitska and Yankee come over from San Francisco. And on the night of the 30th of July, Vitska and Yankee apparently row over on a small boat uh, and giving you an idea how lousy the, the uh, uh, security is, nobody notices. There is a young man named Christoph who has been brought into this thing primarily, I think, as a stalking horse. If we need somebody to blame, we'll use him. He is sent in over the railroad line. He knows some of the guards. They set fires throughout the area and leave, and then kaboom. It goes off with the force of a 5.5 Richter scale earthquake, utterly uh, levels the place. Not too many people are killed, seems to be about six. If you can see in the background of the second picture, that's the Statue of Liberty. And the Statue of Liberty's torch Previously, had been you would be able to climb up into it. It was so badly damaged in this explosion that you've never been able to get up there again. Windows are blown out all over uh, New Jersey and all over Lower Manhattan, and everybody goes into a chicken with their head cut off, run around. Initially, nobody seems to connect the dots that it could have been sabotage. The first people that get arrested are the executives of the Lehigh Valley Railroad that runs the railroad going in there and the executives of the various uh, warehouse companies that had warehouses on Black Tom. They're all being accused of carelessness. Of course, they all get released almost immediately because there's no evidence. The investigation never really turns up anything. And as I'll uh, talk about a little bit later. It takes until 1939 before blame is finally established for this thing. One more guy, Anton Dilger. He's an American. He is a physician trained in Germany. Uh, and he is of very, very German uh, loyalties. He gets involved with German intelligence. And they, what they want him to do is come back to the U.S., with live uh, cultures of glanders and anthrax. They tried it once before, and the guy that brought them in did, had no idea how to keep them alive, and all they are was dust when he arrived. So Dilger comes back. Uh, he establishes a lab to produce these cultures, and going through the Baltimore group, he begins to send people out to try and infect horses and mules. Now, there's no real evidence of any wild outbreaks of either disease. Glanders and, and anthrax are both deadly to animals. Uh, so there are some, yes. But uh, I kind of wonder if you're, say, a, a black stevedore in Baltimore, and some guy comes up to you and using rubber gloves hands you a syringe and says, I want you to take this and stick it in a bunch of horses. It'll make them sick. Here's $20. How many of them actually did that? And how many of them said, right, I got $20. We don't know. Now, Dilger stays doing that for a while and eventually gets summoned back to Germany, where he begins to get the idea that he is now going to be, since other, the others have been chased out of the embassy, the new boss of all clandestine things uh, in the United States. He comes back to the U.S. and then immediately moves to Mexico. And in Mexico, after we're, we uh, get into the war, all of the various agents that have been running around have legged it for safety. Remember what happened to uh, uh, Kurt Yankee? I mean, the uh, Bitsky. Hinch from Baltimore, Yankee from San Francisco are all there in Mexico City. And they're all competing for who is going to be 
the big dog in German intelligence in Mexico. Now, Dilger decides he's going to go get help from home. He goes to Spain thinking he can get to Germany from there. He can't. And shortly thereafter, Dr. Anton Dilger, under an assumed name, dies of the great influenza. Excuse me. The one who wins is Yanke. Hinch leaves. Yanke is left in Mexico. Doesn't seem to accomplish much of anything, but he does continue thing, stirring things up. Now, one of the last major fires was at Kingsland in New Jersey, January 1917. This one is strange because we know exactly who started the fire. We know exactly when and we know exactly where. There was a Polish worker named Wozniak, ethnic Pole, but had been born in Galicia in uh, Austro-Hungarian territory. He's a weird character all the way around. Before this happens, he'd been actually been applying for Russian citizenship. And he was sending letters to the Russian embassy predicting that something bad was going to happen. But on the 11th of January, he's at his workspace in the, uh, the factory. They're making ammunition. And all of a sudden, a fire starts at his workplace. And according to the testimony of everybody around him, he backed up from the fire, looked around, picked up his coat, and left. And the fire quickly grew out of control and destroyed an amazingly large amount of space, mostly because, again, with the quality of construction of these factories, uh, cutouts and firewalls and so forth just didn't exist. Uh, they actually had several thousand people that were turned into more or less refugees as a result of this fire. They went looking for Wozniak, couldn't find him. He checked into a hospital. Eventually, he manages to make it to Mexico, where Hinch takes care of him for a while. What happened to him then, we have no idea. A few other players. Albert Kaltschmidt was a German businessman in Detroit, very anti-allied. Uh, he tries to start his own uh, sabotage cell to blow things up in Canada. They manage to blow up one small place, and then they run around making noise that keeps everybody's attention on them. They're all eventually arrested. Madame Victorica appears in 1917 in New York. Depending on what source you, you read, she's either German who married a South American or South American who married a German. Uh, she may or may not have a title. Uh, she appears in New York, uh, and as opposed to keeping a low profile, she checks into the most expensive hotel in the place, and within a week hires a woman that we would call a professional shopper today and spends $4,000 on new clothes. Again, depending on the source you read, she was either mostly harmless or she was the uh, mastermind of German intelligence at the time, it would appear that mostly she was involved in communication. Uh, mail using uh, secret inks of one sort or another. Some of the clothing she had had secret inks soaked into it that you then soaked out with water. Uh, she is arrested in early 1918 after they watch her for a while going, what is she doing? Uh, and she dies of flu before her trial. Maurice Connors is a, uh, a labor contractor, basically, in New Orleans, uh, with a lot of longshoremen working for him. Rintelen, while he's there, and oh, but, oh by the way, Rintelen gets sent home in August of uh, 1916, so isn't there long. Connors... Uh, is the guy they want to target to talk into cooperating. So Shield, the bomb maker, goes down and talks to him. Connor says, sure, pay me. Uh, Shield goes back. Rindland doesn't like the contract. Connor says, okay, throws away the bombs and keeps the money. You can't really go to the police under those circumstances. 
Now, Oregon farmer Schumacher, he writes a letter early in the war to von Papen suggesting that what they ought to do is collect some of these German uh, reservists, buy some speedboats on the Great Lakes, equip them with machine guns, and go running across the lake and shooting up Canadian uh, uh, ports. That, of course, will make the Canadians keep all their soldiers at home. Now, how are you going to explain this to American police and so forth and so on doesn't seem to come into consideration. And finally, finally, Charles Vunenberg. Vunenberg starts out as a journalist on German payroll. He goes to Germany to write articles uh, favorable to Germany. But while he's there, that's when the, uh, the diplomats are all sent home. So Vunenberg eventually is sent back to the U.S., supposedly to try and rejuvenate the uh, uh, sabotage cell in New York. Unfortunately, he too does not know how to keep a low profile. Takes up room in a rooming house, tells everybody in the rooming house that he works for German intelligence, calls himself Dynamite Charlie, and as far as I can tell, never does anything useful for the Germans, and eventually he is arrested and tried and imprisoned. The ship engine affair. This is one that I love just because, you know, you can write all you want to that I didn't know anything about it. But in the case of von Bernstorff, he writes himself about something that proves that he did. He receives the message that's going to Robert Lansing that tells the United States that Germany is going to reestablish unrestricted submarine warfare. The night before he is to deliver that, he sends a code word out to all of the German sh ships that are interned all around the U.S. There's about 80 of them, instructing him to follow previous directions, which are to break their engines, make it impossible for the ships to be moved. Tell me, if somebody didn't know anything about all these illegal things going on, how, number one, could you have been the guy that established the procedures to disable ships and to have the ability to send out a single code word later on to do it? They actually did quite a bit of damage to a lot of the ships, but most of them were repairable one way or the other. The Vataland, which is what that one is, becomes the USS Leviathan. The, uh, the biggest troop ship we run back and forth. Now, the people who were doing the hunting for the spies, these are the three primary ones. Captain Thomas Tunney ran the New York Police Department bomb squad. Uh, by the way, as soon as the U.S. gets into the war, he is immediately inducted as a major in the Corps of Intelligence Police. Bruce Bielaski is the director of the Bureau of Investigation. And William Flynn is the chief of the Secret Service, which is actually bigger, the bigger of the three. Um, two of these men write books after the war. Tunney, it's the best of the autobiographical ones. It's not too bad. It's mostly a police story, although it is full of the various uh, national and racial prejudices of the day. Bielaski writes nothing. Flynn writes possibly the worst book I have ever been forced to dig my way through. It is written in the style of an early 19th century boy's true adventure, you know, Tom Swift or the, the Rover Boys. It is full of evil, almost uh, mustache twirling Germans. Uh, wonderful, brave, totally uh, effective, intelligent American uh, agents. It's got one brave, pretty young female agent named Dixie, who is willing to infiltrate the Germans and does. And of course, in the last scene of the book, the lead American agent has fallen in love with Dixie, and they are in a close embrace 
as the last of the Germans in the United States are arrested. I'm glad I hadn't had lunch before I read that book. And how about the ones that were chasing? What happened to them? Von Bernstorff returns to Germany under safe conduct. Uh, he is not popular with the German government because they feel he is at least responsible for the U.S. getting into the war, despite the fact that he kept telling him, you're doing it wrong. Uh, he stays involved in German politics, but he, Adolf Hitler helps him. And in 1933, uh, von Bernstorff is in Switzerland at an international disarmament conference, and he and his wife just stay there. And he dies in 1939. Von Papen goes back, goes back to the German army for a while, leaves the army at the end of the war, eventually gets involved in politics, somehow or another worms his way to the top. He is chancellor of Germany for a short period of time. That doesn't work. He then becomes Adolf Hitler's vice chancellor in the rather misguided idea that he can control Hitler. He loses that. He ends up being an ambassador to Turkey. He is acquitted at the Nuremberg Tribunal because he didn't prove he actually personally did anything all that bad and spends the rest of his life criticizing everything to do with democratic Germany. Paul Koenig, the, the tough guy from uh, the docks of New York, uh, is tried on the, for the, uh, the firebombing, spends several years in prison, goes back to Germany, and basically vanishes. Kurt Janke, he is in Mexico at the end of the war, goes back to Germany, forms an organization he calls the Janke Group, which is a private intelligence group, stays connected with the German military. At the end of World War II, uh, the Soviets grab him because he's been so involved with intelligence there. And the short description is he was interrogated and executed. Paul Hilken gets away with it. There's lots of suspicion, but never enough evidence as to what he was doing. And he is never charged or tried. In 1939, he provides stuff that helps the U.S. prove that the Germans actually did Black Tom. Black Tom. And that's the last we hear of him. Lothar Witzke uh, is condemned to death by a court-martial. The uh, sentence is confirmed a week before the armistice, but as soon as the armistice comes, his uh, uh, sentence is commuted to life in prison. 1921, he is released, sent back to Germany. He is given the Iron Cross first and second class and becomes involved with the Abwehr, the intelligence element of the, uh, the German army at the time, stays with him, um, lives through World War II and dies in Hamburg. Major Nikolai, he retires from the army at the end of the war, never has anything else to do with intelligence, the Soviets don't believe it. The NKVD, the, the secret police, grabs him at the end of World War II. He's hauled to Moscow, and he dies in an NKVD hospital in 1947. Von Bopp, once he gets out of prison in 1921, he goes back to Germany and sort of fades into the bureaucracy of German Foreign Office before retiring. However, young Mr. Von Hilken, has an entirely different idea after he is released in 21. He stays in the US, somehow or another, I can't figure out how, becomes an American citizen and uh, becomes one of a little group of former German uh, personnel, officers mostly, who work for Eric von Stroheim in Hollywood. And he becomes an actor and a producer uh, all the way through to include being a nasty Nazi officer in various uh, movies in World War II. Hinch goes back to Germany. He starts a longshoreman stevedoring operation in Hamburg and just kind of fades into the business world. Von Rintelen, now here we have the prize. Von Rintelen goes 
tries to get back to Germany. He's picked up by the British. Uh, they intern him. Eventually, though, he is sent back to the United States, where he is tried and convicted on charges of violating the uh, antitrust laws because of his labor activities. Sentenced to four years in prison in Atlanta. He goes to prison in Atlanta. The German government of the time makes a half-hearted attempt to get him released. But uh, stays there, complaining bitterly the whole time. He's being treated not as a German officer, but as a, as a common criminal. Uh, he always has a very, very high opinion of himself. He is released. He goes back to Germany expecting the same kind of, of welcome that uh, Witzke got. Nobody's interested. Partially because at this point they really don't want to stir things up in memory anymore, and partially because von Papen is rising in politics and von Papen is his mortal enemy. Ritalin stays in Germany until 1933, about the time that von Papen becomes the chancellor. He then goes to Britain. Now, he has claimed all along that he was a captain in the German Navy. He wasn't. He was a Capitaine Leutnant, about, about full, full lieutenant level. He tells everybody in Britain that he was the real head of German intelligence in the United States throughout the war. And he does. He gets books published. He gets people supporting him. But he spends World War II interned as an enemy alien and dies shortly after the war. And finally, poor von Dumba, he gets back to Austria. The first things the Austrians do is they make him a count, so he's now von Dumba, which is more or less raising the bird to the United States. Uh, he retires, and that's about the last we hear of him. Most of these people have various experiences after the war. What happened to so many of the hundreds of others who participated, some got jail time, some got away with it. It's almost impossible to say. Aftermath, later on after 1917, you still have accidents and disasters, but we don't really know who did a lot of them. Still could have been industrial problems. After the war, there was something called the Joint Claims Commission, which uh, was supposed to settle German uh, payments for damage they caused before we got into the war. Things like the Lusitania. A lot of the smaller explosions and fires, um, a commission's decision is made and a payment is made, not very big. However, the big gun is Black Tom. That amounts to $50 million. And the Joint Claims Commission continues to debate that until 1939. And finally, using some papers that the Hilke had provided, a decision was made they admitted, yes, we did it. Adolf Hitler ain't paying nothing to the United States for that. We finally have a settlement with the Federal Republic of Germany in 1953, and they made their last payment, which the whole thing came to about $170 million in original um, amount plus interest in 1979. And that, folks, is the end of that story. Very, very good. All right. I think uh, we all owe uh, and we all owe gratitude uh, to Lee for going through all of this. There's a huge amount of work there, and you clearly have made this a uh, I won't say a labor of love, but certainly a, a labor everything. at times of fascination. All right. Does anyone, we're, it's getting kind of late, so I don't think we're going to have extensive discussion. Does anyone have any burning questions? I think not. Uh, Lee, again, thank you very much for that. It's, uh, I'm, I'm impressed at a couple of things, you know, the sheer ineptitude of a lot of this 
maybe these are just the ones that got caught. Maybe some of the others that were less inept uh, and more skilled at their trade never got caught and set a few fires and got away with it. But it's really hard to tell. <clears throat> well, when I did the one on S on uh, the, uh, <clears throat> I could speak. I did the one on propaganda. It was obvious that uh, there were a lot of just plain amateurs involved there too. These people were not a good example of German efficiency. World War I was not an outstanding example of German efficiency. <laughs> so perhaps that's uh, understandable and even consistent. Anyway, thank you all for attending.